Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us into this webinar today. I hope you're all well and we can get some discussion going about uh, using this webinar format. I'm Phil Bowden and we have Carl Larson from RMCG who's been involved uh, with the evaluation of the project uh, all the way through. And we've also got Julia Severi from CESAR in as well to help. And she's um, very kindly offered to uh, help us with our questions. Um, we also have many of our, uh, the local agronomists and entomologists who helped me with the workshops and crop walks um, last season as well. So I guess going forward, this type of uh, meeting may become very familiar. So um, we've got to get used to all this. Um, so um, I'll just hand over to Carl for a minute. Uh, he might give you a, a few uh, details of how, we, how we're going to, to do this today. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll start um, uh, with um, the presentation uh, after that. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Phil, and hello, everybody. I uh, hope you're keeping well um, during these very unprecedented times indeed. But look, I'll be moderating the session today with Phil taking the lead on the, the presentation and discussion and Q&A. Um, we're going to try and get as much involvement throughout uh, the session as possible. So just a, a little bit of housekeeping before we do get stuck into it. Um, if this is your first session or you haven't joined a webinar in a while, um, you'll see there's a, a go to webinar control panel off to the side of your screen or device. Um, and this is really your, your kind of mission control for the session today. Um, you'll see um, you can also view who else is online through the attendees drop down box. But what I wanted to make sure you are aware of is a couple of things. One is the, the question uh, pane which at any time throughout the, the session today, please type in a question there and we'll make sure we can put that to both Phil and Julia and others um, to get answered as well. Um, and anything that we don't address, we'll make sure we follow up offline with you individually. There's also a handouts drop down that you would have seen. We've got the uh, fantastic guide there that Caesar produced last year before these um, pre-season workshops started. So that's there if you haven't already got a copy or you've, you've lost it, you can click and download at any time. Um, there's a couple of other resources there on aphids and resistance management too, if you wanted to uh, have a look at those. This session is being recorded too, and we'll make that available to everyone online. And for those that couldn't make it or, or have a, um, a poor connection if they're out in the paddock, um, don't worry, we'll absolutely distribute this so you can watch it afterwards as well. Um, we're going to be running a, a number of polls during the session, which is your chance to kind of get involved um, after Phil does a bit of his presentation. These will appear on your screen as some multi-choice question and answers, and I can share back the responses with, with everybody, and we're going to talk through what they mean. Um, so if it's the first time that you've answered or been involved in those, it's just like clicking a, a kind of live survey. All question uh, answers are anonymous. Um, and we're gonna aim to get you out of here before the hour's up. But if we do finish up early, then um, we can all break for an early lunch. If you don't have a sandwich in front of you, you're in the screen already. So Phil, I'll hand back over to you to take us through the first part of the session. Thank you, Carl. Yep. So look, I just wanted to um, do a recap on uh, what we did last season. Um, we had a, a program of um, pre-season workshops, um, the paddock walks, and then um, later on a webinar, and we've done some YouTube and podcast activities uh, that were uh, all completed uh, very well, uh, with lots of um, help from um, some of the locals. Um, and many of you that are on, online today. So um, it, it was quite hard to find crops in some areas to do the crop walks. Um, but look, in general, um, all our activities were really well supported. Uh, total numbers we had last year was around 350 um, farmers, advisors, and agribusiness uh, people. So uh, that was excellent. Uh, the workshops, 
were sort of dominated by the advisors and agronomists. Uh, but the crop walks, we had, yeah, lots of um, farmers attending those as well. So we looked at um, a few different things, um, monitoring techniques, a range of um, control method, methods, um, cultural controls uh, in particular, and the biocontrols from both resident and transient beneficials. Uh, there was lots of interest in pest and natural enemy interactions um, and how we can reduce uh, the chemical use or um, by using alternate means of, uh, of control. Uh, there were some really e excellent um, photos sent in, um, actually there's a couple there um, on the screen that um, Rhino uh, uh, sent up from, from, um, from uh, Maury. Um, We've been using those in a few presentations. So um, the little macro lenses that we gave out have come to good use, I think. And look, um, during the season, we had lots of interactions with you, uh, inquiries um, you know, from you later on that came about for different pests. Um, so yeah, there was, it, was, it was good. You know, we, we enjoyed doing those um, presentations and the crop walks. Um, so just uh, a bit on last season, uh, it was a really tough one for most farmers um, growing crops in general, but in particular for canola. Uh, the drought conditions in many areas uh, meant that canola was often stressed and it attracted a lot of insects, particularly um, aphids and caterpillars. We saw uh, substantial numbers of um, green peach aphid uh, right through the season. Um, and they came in early. Um, a lot of those um, crops that were planted on the um, early uh, the February rainfall uh, had substantial numbers. And, and also um, diamondback moth uh, was very, very prominent early in the season. And then as we went through, uh, there were lots of aphids, uh, turnip and cabbage aphid in particular. Um, the, the encouraging thing was that there were the, the numbers of natural enemies for aphids built up pretty quickly. And we got uh, pest uh, populations down, um, especially for aphids, you know, below thresholds that didn't really warrant spraying in many cases. Um, I was expecting that we'd see more diamondback moth as a problem in spring, but uh, perhaps the conditions uh, didn't suit them. They weren't as big a problem as, as we thought. Uh, I guess in the end, though, that uh, many canola crops uh, were grazed or baled uh, rather than taken through to grain. So a lot of the pest uh, levels weren't really considered too much at harvest. So uh, uh, now for this um, uh, coming season, uh, we've had an interesting start in many areas. Uh, Lots of areas have had uh, substantial summer rainfall, and we're obviously dealing with a green bridge uh, for a lot of our winter crops. Uh, and that has been home to several um, insect species already. Uh, I'm, we're expecting um, you know, higher levels of uh, green peach aphid, diamondback moth again, uh, cabbage centre grub, uh, which is often a problem in those grazing um, canola crops. Uh, and the one that we've seen prominently early uh, in this district, and, and I believe um, you know, through other areas in Victoria as well, is this weed webworm. Um, this was sent in by one of my local agronomists um, uh, this week, and it's you know some massive numbers of um, weed web uh, worm caterpillars invading um, uh, emerging crops. You can see there that's a, uh, a crop um, from Illabo here near, near uh, Cootamundra uh, that is probably in the three to four leaf stage. Uh, it's being inundated with, um, with that uh, particular um, uh, caterpillar. Uh, and we've heard too, um, Melina Miles has had a note out on um, the beet sheet yesterday about beet webworm in mung beans in the north. So it just shows you how quickly uh, insect 
um, some of these pest species that, that can react to um, food sources, even after we've had that severe drought. So um, with, as far as other uh, species go, with the, um, the warm, dry conditions last spring, uh, it probably wasn't that favourable for um, other pests like red-legged earth mite um, for egg laying. So yeah, maybe numbers this this uh, autumn may be lower. Um, so what we're hoping to do today is to get some feedback on um, how these activities that we did did last year um, might affect um, uh, how you manage uh, pests. What practice changes uh, are needed to use more integrated pest management in your farming system? Um, so you were trying to combine all the all the resources that we have at hand um, to get our pests down below um, damaging levels. So we've got a series of um, questions here that um, they're, they're interactive. Um, I uh, will actually be able to show you the responses um, after each question and uh, we can sort of discuss the outcomes um, as a group. So, so I might hand over to Carl to um, uh, give you some instructions about how we're going to do that. Um, he, he's the expert on um, running this um, type of um, interactive um, webinar. So thank you, Carl. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. And uh, thanks for the great intro too. You may have noticed just up on your screen at the moment, there's a question that's come up called Quick Poll. Um, we'd just like to just start with a pretty easy one and just understand whether or not you attended one of the pre-season workshops, uh, a mid-season paddock walk and or the webinar um, between June and September last year. You can actually just click on your answer and submit that. And I can see some responses are coming through. Um, we've got about 80 or so percent people voted at the moment. So I'll keep it open for a little longer and share those back. 95% of us. So I'll, I'll close that and share the results back. Um, so Phil, we can see here, we've got uh, two thirds of uh, everyone online um, attended one or um, a couple of those things. We had 10% that went to all three, so that's a big gold star, and uh, just under a quarter with, with none. So that just helps us gauge uh, the discussion and where everyone's up to um, before we can uh, uh, get into the detail. That's interesting, uh, Carl, that we've got 25% online now that um, couldn't attend something last year. So um, yeah, it shows that there's interest in this subject. Yeah, which is excellent. Um, for those that did attend, um, I just wanted to bring up uh, another question and, and launch that with you now as well. Um, what things did you enjoy most about coming along to the activities? So it'd be great um, to get your feedback on that. Uh, you'll see there's a couple of options there to choose from. So similar to the first uh, poll that you did, just feel free you can select one or as many options as you like here. Um, and that just provides, um, I guess, some useful feedback to, to Phil and the rest of the team about what worked well and perhaps some, some areas for improvement. So we've got so half of people voted. Those coming in. And what I might do is just is close that off and share the results back with you. So Phil, some really interesting results there. I might hand over to you to just talk through what that means and what we're finding. Okay, so yeah, look, um, we've got 83% um, of you thought that the information um, about the range of pests and natural enemies was, was good. So I guess that's very encouraging. Uh, the other good ones here, the discussion about monitoring, that's always a, a tough one. Um, you know, especially when you need um, to take um, a range of um, objects out to, to do the monitoring. Uh, it's always going to be um, uh, something that's, um, uh, you know, we, we need to, to do more training and, and, and have uh, better um, 
um, able to do monitoring. Um, and the networking though, that, and that's one that I, I really think um, was a positive uh, when we did these workshops. Um, we had a range of experienced agronomists um, come and uh, also some um, uh, agronomists that were uh, quite um, fresh out of uni and the interactions that we had with um, both those different groups is, is it was amazing with the workshops. So, so yeah, that's that's interesting there. So, uh, where to get more information? Yeah, it only polled 25%. So I guess it's showing that a lot of you are probably um, okay with the, with the setups that we've got in place already. So, yep. So Excellent. that's good. Hmm. Fantastic. Um, now, as a result of um, each of those activities, again, we're, we're going to make sure there's a, a good level of interaction here. Um, were you able to actually better manage pests after participating in, in one or all of these activities? We're interested in your feedback on that too. And I think, Phil, when we're, we're looking here um, around the importance of things like discussion about monitoring, um, it'll be interesting to see the results come in um, for this too, um, and also people valuing that that kind of interaction with experienced agronomists, um, noting that support is a really important function of, of kind of the journey of IPM and, and progressing along the spectrum. So we've just got uh, so Carl, over uh, Yep, Carl, you know, uh, we're um, happy to take questions about all these question, uh, questions that are going up as well. So if you if mm. you wanted to, um, you know, uh, type a question in for us, um, you know, about any of these, yeah, feel free to do that too. Great, so results are in, Phil, and I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you to go through those for us. Yep, so what we're seeing there, um, yeah, majority, um, uh, the planning ahead, was interesting. I think um, uh, having no surprises uh, at the beginning of the season, you know, when you've looked at um, uh, perhaps the paddock histories or the, the crops that are uh, preceding it, whether you've had green bridge uh, and planning ahead uh, to preempt which pest, that's, that's um, been, a, been a good one there. Um, monitoring, yeah, to see if pests are building up or declining. That's um, uh, certainly um, something that, that we need to um, have good records for. A lot of you would be using um, perhaps um, some of those automated um, um, uh, systems, um, Ag World, etc., cetera, um, to, um, to record things. So that, that's a really good uh, way of um, keeping track of whether pests are building up or not. Uh, and allow, yeah, allowing natural enemies to build up. Um, that's a really important one if we're going to progress uh, to using less chemicals as well. Just on that point, Phil, there around allowing natural enemies to build up, um, often that's one that people are most cautious um, about, aren't they, in terms of just starting out or, or keeping an eye on things linked to monitoring very much so. Yeah, look, the, uh, I mean, the, the, there'll often be a lag period between when you see pests and then when you see the range of natural enemies coming in. Uh, it's often a bit of a leap of faith to um, let the, um, uh, the beneficials um, uh, do that work rather than and, um, popping in with a, you know, a chemical. Um, you know, sometimes that's necessary but often yeah, we can allow a lot of the natural enemies um, to actually take control. Mm. And Julia, I might throw to you um, just for your um, summary or any comments that you might have uh, on what we're seeing on the screen at the moment with the poll. Yeah, I guess um, it's interesting to see that you've got sort of a low, low percentage with the less use of um, chemicals that are toxic to natural enemies. Um, and it'll be, I guess it'll be interesting to know, I'm not sure we can get the answer to this, of how much of that is because there is um, a lack of selective insecticides or, or perhaps it could be more of a cost factor. Mm. So 
uh, as I mentioned before, if you wanted to put in any comments or questions into that question pane um, there to provide clarification or, or wanting to discuss something specific that I can put to Phil and Julia along the way, please feel free to do so because um, that just makes sure the, uh, the discussion is as valuable as possible. But um, great to get your input along the way. So Phil, I might move um, to our, our next question, which was looking at um, what the main problem pests people are dealing with in Kamala are out there. And I think, um, you know, as you mentioned in your introduction, last season compared to this, there's been a bit of a shift. Um, so it'd be great to see um, what people's uh, experience are out on the ground. We've just got about half the people voted at the moment. Make sure we're clicking through on the screen there. Fantastic. And that's pretty much everyone in the door and voted now. So I'm just going to close that and uh, share it back with everyone. So um, yeah, look, no surprises there, Phil, in terms of uh, your introduction and some of those slides. Yeah, look, uh, right across the state last year, I guess we had green peach aphid um, and the aphids in general. Uh, yeah, and that's no surprise. Most uh, years we'll get um, uh, aphids in canola. Um, whether they're causing damage or not uh, is often questionable because they often, you know, as we know with all those aphids, they have a huge range of natural enemies and Quite often, uh, I mean, we, we, there have been seasons where we've had plagues of lady beetles or hoverflies uh, at times, and the, and the natural enemies are well on top of those. But then, you know, we know that green peach aphid, um, it's not resistant to any of those natural enemies, but uh, there are issues with uh, most of the chemicals that we, we commonly use for it. Uh, even the ones that still work, um, we're often um, uh, wondering about um, how long, um, say, uh, transform is actually going to be um, effective. And we know that the danger uh, with green peach aphid is uh, them bringing the virus in. Um, we haven't seen too much of a problem with the virus for a few years, but um, it's still a worry because. Um, um, with that uh, particular virus, turn up yellows, um, it only takes a few um, uh, of the aphids to actually transfer the disease into into a um, emerging crop, and then um, you know the consequences can be quite uh, quite large. So um, green peach aphid is definitely one of the uh, problem um, pests that we're dealing with, you know, in, in canola in particular. Uh, the other one, yeah, the caterpillars, yeah, we've had a whole range of caterpillars and, and this year looks like no exception, uh, particularly with this green bridge that we've got. Um, it's interesting too that, to show that, uh, yeah, the millipedes and the earwigs, uh, uh, slugs, probably not snails in this region, but um, are, are quite significant there. Um, and I guess that's associated with the higher levels of stubble that, that um, most people are dealing with. And, and no one was dealing with any of the beetles or weevils last year. So that, that's that's an interesting statistic there. Hmm. And Julia, I'm just interested in your thoughts, how that aligns with uh, your pest facts um, service that says are run. Is that, is that closely aligned or are you seeing some exceptions there with the New South Wales um, experience? Yeah, it is. Oh, I, I'm surprised a little bit about the millipedes and earwigs. Um, I would have thought it may have been a little bit higher just because um, they are one of the trickier ones to to control. I mean, there's not m like much registered, especially against earwigs. Um, and if it is a stubble retained system, um, there's very few control options available. And I wonder if maybe that has got to do with the distribution across New South Wales and, and that these species aren't um, perhaps 
a problem in the northern regions where like the, the European earwig and the black Portuguese millipede um, just don't exist. Mm. Uh, Julia, it also be, uh, we probably should have um, broken the mites down uh, into a bit more, you know, we've bulked them all together there, but um, I know in particular areas, you know, we've had um, uh, less problem with uh, red-legged earth mite and blue oak mite and more problems with um, some of the others, Bryovia in particular and Velostium. Yes, yep. What's your take on that? Uh, last year I do recall Bryovia being yeah a bit of an issue, um, particularly around um, chemical control, even using um, the registered rates um, and we did put this down to the fact that Bryovia is um, essentially one name for seven species of which we don't really understand a whole lot about. Um, so that was the issue that came up with uh, Brobia last year, just seeing those inconsistencies in, in chemical control. Mm -hmm. um, what levels of resistance have, have you seen for Brobia then, um, Julia? Have you got figures on that? Oh, look, it's, it's not resistance. Um, it's more of a higher it's, it's, it's tolerance. Um, and mm -hmm. because yeah, you've got that species difference, um, it's likely that some of the species are more uh, uh, not resistant, more tolerant to insecticides uh, than others. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Just on your point, Phil, there around resistance uh, management, we do have a handout there for green peach aphid on on your control panel if you want to take that away with you, um, as well as one of the uh, GRDC back pocket guides for aphids too. Just picking up that point with 84% yep. um, of people really finding aphids uh, an issue. Um, it's good that we've uh, been, I guess, a bit preemptive and popped some uh, some information there for you. Um, Carl, too, I might um, add there too, that there are resistance and management strategies developed for a lot of these pests that we're, we're mentioning here, including red-legged earth mite uh, and um, diamondback moth and Heliophis, and they're all listed uh, together on the GRDC website uh, there. Um, so we we could um, um, send you out copies of those too if, if, if needed. Fantastic. So following on from that question, we're really interested, um, based on each of those problem pests, do you think we provided enough information about each of the pests uh, their natural enemies and also the range of control options. And again, uh, it's stretching the memory probably um, this time last year with the pre-season workshops um, and then into the uh, the mid-season paddock walks. But um, we'd be interested in your feedback there. Just a quick multi-choice one um, before we share those results back with each of you. Um, Carl, just in saying, I mean, one of the things that came out at all those workshops and the crop walks was how um, well that uh, guide was put together by, by Julia in particular. And uh, yeah, everyone, uh, we've actually run out of copies of the hard copy, um, but it is online there. Um, and it, I think it's a fantastic resource. Yeah, great. Um, so Phil, those results there are very much reflecting your, your comment um, around the, the guide being the centre point of the, the information provision. Um, a couple with no, and I'd be interested to uh, hear people's thoughts on, on why that was the case. But Phil, I'll hand over to you to um, talk us through what we're saying. Uh, yeah, look, um, in general, um, the, um, the written information uh, that was given, given uh, and we, the PowerPoint um, that we used at the workshops uh, followed uh, that guide um, pretty much um, right through. And uh, you know, the reaction we got from most people was that it was a really good um, uh, takeaway from, from, from the workshops or the, or the crop walks. Um, I think we did, we printed 400 copies and they all disappeared. Um, hopefully people are still using them. Mm, mm. Um, Phil and Julia, we've just had a question in from Sam. So thanks for sending that uh, through, Sam. 
Just wondering about your thoughts on reduced soilborne uh, insects early due to low stubble um, residue in paddocks this year. Yes, look, that's um, certainly um, uh, a possibility. Uh, the uh, you know the nearly all those um, northern areas uh, of New South Wales had um, either no crop or, or, or very little crop um, planted or, or harvested. Um, so yeah, there probably is less um, organic matter out there. So um, a lot of those um, pests that we see with um, you know things like whether they're millipedes or earwigs or um, um, the various other stubble-borne insects, um, yeah, it may not be such an, an issue this this season. Uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, from others in that northern region, um, you know, what the conditions of paddocks are. You know, there's probably a, a fair bit of um, crop already planted uh, up there, uh, and whether there were issues with um, with getting through stubble or uh, I, I doubt it. Um, so yeah. Mm. The pests are related to that uh, about slugs as well, Phil. But um, Julia, we might hand to you just to um, get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting question, um, and yeah, I, I guess we'll, we'll see as as um, time plays out. But um, some of these species, which are stubble pests, um, can likely survive um, on what is in the soil because they are detritivores. Um, so it could be that some species. Um, can churn over with with what is remaining um, and that they only reach these pest levels when they're in very high numbers so yeah it would be very interesting to see how that how that plays out mm. yeah some of those uh, pests um, I guess they they're usually uh, just a part of the um, the natural order of stubble degradation mm. and they don't actually feed on on crops uh, when there's Plenty of uh, alternate uh, material, but yeah, if, this, if they have built up over the years because of high levels of stubble, and then uh, last year uh, having less stubble to feed on, whether they do change, um, uh, you know, back to um, being herbivores. Mm. Uh, and I thought that might be a good segue, Phil, just for this next question we've got up for for everyone to respond to just around um, changes in the pest spectrum in recent years. That was uh, a very good segue. So Sam, thank you very much for prompting us there. That's great. Um, and just, yeah, some commentary there, Phil, around that increased double load. Um, so that's up on people's screen now, if they'd like to fill it out. Um, I think there'll be a really great discussion off the back of this in terms of what we see back in the responses. So we've got about, just under half of people voted. So if you haven't, just click through and we'll share those back with people. Right, that's the majority through now. So I'll, uh, I'll close that off and share it back with everyone. Yeah, okay, so earlier sowing dates. Um, Phil, take us through what we're seeing here. Yeah, okay, I mean, that's, um uh, been part of the research, particularly in, in southern New South Wales anyway, uh, the um, change to earlier sowing dates. Uh, the, um, and that, I guess, changes the spectrum. Um, you're more likely to encounter uh, perhaps some of the, well, um, especially if you've got a green bridge, uh, the pests like uh, green peach aphid, or uh, some of those caterpillars um, that have attacked canola, um, the uh, and less likely uh, the mites being a problem. Um, you know, we know that the mites um, need that trigger of um, cool, wet conditions uh, for a few days. So, if with an earlier sowing date, you're probably going to avoid them. Um, so, yeah, that's that is really interesting that. Um, the earlier sowing dates is, is the majority there. Uh, and increased double loads here, yeah, we know, you know uh, most 
farmers are either you know into zero or no till type <coughs> systems uh, at the moment. So um, new crops, yeah, in the in the in the system, yeah, whether um, that that may well be um, uh, a factor, you know, increased number of pulses in particular, or um, perhaps here yeah, the companion cropping that's quite popular. Mm. And yeah, uh, ten percent just no change. And interesting too to see changes in cropping sequences not really driving any any major change in the no. mass spectrum. Phil, no. look, there's probably um, yeah, there's there's only a, uh, so many crops that can go into a rotation, and mm -hmm. probably a lot of people have have, um, have have experimented with you know what the um, the different crops they can grow in their region and what sequence that they can go in. Uh, there there probably has been a bit more of um, uh, like double break crops uh, with say a pulse and canola um, to try and uh, uh, you know, we, we know that um, a lot of those resistant weeds, um, um, ryegrass in particular, uh, are a major problem for most farmers. So yeah, perhaps a few um, uh, changes where they're using a double break. Mm. Um, before I go to you, Julia, I just thought I'd throw a question from Mick. Uh, thanks for that, Mick. He's just mentioned that they're currently seeing an increased number of cabbage centre grubs in early sown uh, grazing canola. How soft an approach should be taken? Um, the temptation is to include a SP um, with the upcoming post-emergent. Will this cause any issues down the track? So Phil, I might start with you uh, before going to Julia on that. Uh, yeah, look, it, it's uh, often a, a problem because those um, often the um, earlier sown crops are going to be grazed um, as soon as possible. So um, yeah, we know yeah, cabbage centre grub can create uh, quite a bit of damage early on, uh, but I guess the alternatives are that. Um, it, it will disappear as soon as we get some cool weather. Um, it's mainly a, um, a warmer season uh, pest, and I guess if, the sooner you can graze, it, you know, you 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 can use grazing as a as a control method for it as well to some to some degree. So um, mm. we prefer, especially early season, to try and preserve as many of the beneficials. Um, uh, and possibly if you're going to be using an SP uh, to control that, uh, that uh, cabbage center grub, um, yeah, you will destroy some of your um, beneficials. And Julia, yeah. any uh, follow-up comments on uh, Mick's question there? Yeah, I guess the trick with um, cabbage center grub is that uh, it can engage in this borer-like behavior, so you can get it boring into um, the growing plants and also in between leaves. So uh, the issue, I, I, well, I can't comment on the actual efficacy of SPs because I'm not sure, but we do know some of the um, issues arise from actually being able to to contact the grubs. So that's something to to consider. Uh, and like Phil said, um, it's a warm season pest. So as we head towards winter, uh, we should uh, be able to see a reduction in numbers. Um, but I, I understand at the moment that yes, yeah, some some farms are. Uh, being impacted by cabbage centre grub, especially when um, the canola or the forage brassic is at that very young stage. Um, I've seen quite a few photos come through of some um, some of that blistering in the young can canola. Um, so canola, it can push through. We have had um, reports of canola being able to push through, but it, it definitely can do damage uh, in some years. Mm. Thanks, Julia. Um, just one other comment. So, yeah, go for it, Phil. Sorry. Uh, quite often, yeah, especially in seasons like this where we've got reasonably good moisture and uh, warm conditions, you know, the canola, uh, especially people that are um, growing some of those vigorous varieties, you know, the canola will be capable of um, outgrowing uh, a lot of that damage. Um, so that's something you need to take into account. I guess you know, it depends on what stage. Uh, the canola is at, 
power and whether you need to put a um, control in. Obviously, if it's just emerging and you're finding um, uh, you know pests, you know, like the uh, weed web uh, uh, worm that we've seen a lot of here, uh, or cabbage centre grub. Uh, yeah, we want to um, not have patches in the crop, bare patches in a crop, but um, if, if the uh, canola is reasonably well advanced, uh, it is quite capable of um, outgrowing some of that damage. Mm. Thanks, Phil. Julia, I just wanted to go back to the, the poll that's up on our, our screens at the moment, and just with 65% of, of people online noting that earlier sowing dates mm. as uh, an issue driving changes in the pest spectrum in recent years. I'm interested in your you know, top one or two insights uh, around that particular finding. Yeah, I just, just um, it just goes to show that, yeah, with, with these um, earlier sowing dates, um, just the spectrum of pests increase. You've got these warm season pests, which I guess traditionally we never uh, regarded as sowing pests, um, now regarded as sowing pests like um, diamondback moth and, and, and the cabbage centre grub are the yeah, two, um, two examples I can think of, and also a cabbage white butterfly to to an extent. So yeah, we've got these three um, Lepidoptera and moth species, um, which are warm season pests that are now we can put in the suite of um, establishment pests for for those who have um, who, who who farm with with those early, early sowing dates. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks everyone, and thanks for those. Uh, questions, keep them coming through. Um, I'd like to just keep progressing through and making sure we get your input uh, and thoughts. So there's uh, another poll, second last. We didn't want to have a too exhaustive list, so we've just got eight questions to go through, this being, being the uh, number seven. Um, so we're just interested in some of the main barriers um, for you in moving to an IPM program for pest management in cropping systems. Um, by now, hopefully, we know the drill just in terms of clicking on one or more of the options, um, and we'll share those uh, results back as well and get some um, insights from Phil and Julia. I think this one's a really important one, particularly for the uh, the season ahead um, and where some of those opportunities might be. So, Gus got around 60% of us voted. That's Increasing slightly, I'll keep it open for another five or ten seconds to allow any last minute votes to come in. And I'll, uh, I'll share that back with everyone now. So Phil, I'll hand over to you. Um, some interesting results in there. Number one coming through, you know, benefits of IPM may not be obvious immediately, which uh, does create some uncertainty. Yeah, that, that um, I guess is um, quite expected. It's what we've uh, known has been a barrier for a long time. And, you know, we know too that um, if you are converting over to um, many IPM techniques, whether it's using cultural or relying on you know, biological controls that, that are out there, uh, it is often a leap of faith to, um, to go to that point rather than, than using a, a chemical, uh, because you know we in, in most cases um, we find that the beneficials are you know lagging maybe a week or ten days often behind when we're seeing damage from pests, uh, and you know rather than leave it uh, you know to a lot of the beneficials. Um, you know, it is much easier to make that decision about it, uh, using a chemical. So yeah, that uncertainty um, is um, is something that you know, we, we've known is a, is a barrier. Um, and again, yeah, using chemicals, yeah, simple and quick, rather than um, you know having um, to to use IPM techniques, which are often complex and you know, they, they take longer to, to work. Um, the good thing there, I think, is um, monitoring there, 28% showing there. So 
that's not one of the main barriers. So it, I guess it shows that lots of people are uh, committed to doing, uh, to monitoring in different ways, to, to look at different pests. And yeah, the monitoring techniques aren't too difficult for a lot of people. So that, that's really good. Um, mm. Interesting to see there, Phil, uh, in one of our earlier polls and discussions around um, what people found uh, most useful after coming along to one of the sessions was you know, two thirds um, really valuing the monitoring and how to start using more IPM methods. So um, great that that's uh, as low as it is. Mm. And look, the other one too there, um, agronomists don't want to risk their reputation. We know that, um, you know, agronomists obviously, um, you know, are um, being relied upon to make, um, you know, good decisions for farmers. But we know that also too, that uh, if you're going to a swap over to IPM techniques, you really need the farmer or in lots of cases, we know it's the farmer's wife that wants to reduce the chemical that um, farmers are exposed to. Um, so yeah, we need a commitment by the, the farming uh, and, and the agronomist to um, uh, start to rely on um, some alternative techniques other than just chemicals. Mm. And Julia, interested in your insights there, I mean, particularly around um, some of those those major barriers around you know, chemical control still um, being relatively effective in terms of limited assistance uh, management issues or cost effective, but also just those benefits, perhaps, um, yeah, Phil's referred to the leap of faith a couple of times as well. I'm just interested to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's interesting to say using chemicals is simple and quick and they still work is at 50%. Um, be interesting to see how much the barrier is because of uh, resistance in, in your pests like um, your, your diamondback moth, or perhaps it's because there aren't the chemicals available with um, you know a lot of the stubble pests or, or, the, or the soil pests where you, you actually can't reach them. Um, yeah, with the with the insecticides, yeah. Mm. And we've just had a, a comment come in from Greg. Thanks, Greg. Just saying that a, a lack of reliable thresholds makes it hard to communicate a firm message to clients. And um, Phil, I know you've had many discussions around this. So I might hand to you just to respond to that in the first instance. Yes. Look, um, actually, one of our um, uh, the next in the next part is about um, you know whether that's uh, an issue for people and uh, I, I, I was part of a, uh, a research program over the last few years about uh, looking at uh, thresholds and a lot of the um, participants that we've got on with us today uh, may well, will have been involved with that as well uh, finding out how important um, having information about uh, when on when you uh, need to spray or whether you can leave it to the, um, the beneficials. Yeah, having those thresholds. The other thing that we really don't have a very good handle on, um, it probably needs more work, or definitely needs more work, is um, the interactions between uh, beneficials and pests. Uh, how many beneficials do we need to be looking at uh, in, in the field before we can say uh, we can leave it to them or will they need help um, you know can you put a spray on um, and then um, uh, leave it to the, to the beneficials to, to mop up the rest um, so they're, they're the sort of questions that we we haven't really got answers to in many cases um, uh, the cotton industry, uh, the horticulture industry have probably done uh, more work uh, in um, having some answers there about uh, how many beneficials are required to keep a, uh, a pest population under control. So, 
And are there opportunities to, um, as you said, look over the fence to other industries, uh, Phil, and start adapting and um, making that that information more specific? Oh, look, definitely. Um, uh, we've got there's quite a bit of overseas work um, done on that. We just need to adapt it um, for our Australian cropping situation. Uh, a lot of those crops, so say cotton, for example. Uh, is uh, you know where you have um, monitoring every few days in it, um, and you know it's a high value crop. Uh, we we sort of can't go to that extent of monitoring, I guess, um, you know, just because of our broad broad scale um, cropping that we that we have. Um, but there are definitely uh, things that we can look at. You know, things like um, the area-wide management that's done, you know, where there's you know, whole uh, groups of farmers in, in, a, in a region that are working together on keeping you know, particular pests in, in check. Um, so yeah, there, there are things that we can can learn from that, those other um, uh, other crops. Thanks, Phil. And Julia, um, comment on, on thresholds, uh, just off the back of Greg's uh, comment there. Yeah, um, I tried, uh, they are useful thresholds when, when we do have them available, um, but I, I'd, I'd try and put the emphasis more on the pest trends and, 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 and what they are doing, um, because in the day, some of these beneficials um, are very cryptic in their nature. They might be night active, so we're not going to be able to monitor uh, all beneficials, um, things like spiders and, and, and very small snout mites, which are in the soil. Um, so, you know, they're harder to monitor than, say, like your, your ladybird beetles and, and your parasitoid wasps. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julia. And there's a follow up question uh, or comment from Greg too, just saying there's a trend to using grazing crops such as wheat and canola rather than perennial pasture. Is this reduction in diversity going to make IPM more difficult in the future? I'm not too uh, sure about that one. On that one. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an interesting one, Greg. Um, I probably think that it, uh, it will help. Yeah, I mean, grazing a crop can be an alternative to um, treating it with a pesticide. You know, you're, you're actually grazing the, the pest out of out of things. Um, you know, yeah, we probably haven't done much work on um, the relationship between grazing and you know when pests occur even. Um, so, but I, look, I don't think um, it's probably a barrier to uh, adopting. Um, some more IPM or cultural uh, methods. In, in fact, you know, a lot of the grazing crops are planted earlier, they grow quicker, um, and they can actually, um, um, you know, um, resist uh, too much damage you know, compared to another um, non-grazed crop. Mm, thanks, Phil. And with that segue in mind, thanks, Greg, in terms of being uh, future focused. I mean, we'd really be interested just as we uh, come into the last five minutes or so of the session um, to understand what extra support or information you'd find uh, useful or need to introduce IPM as a standard practice for pest management. Um, you'll see one of the options out of the five there touches on some of that um, threshold or dynamic uh, research that uh, we were talking about before, um, but also some other areas where that might assist. So feel free to click through last poll of the day um, and we'll share those results back uh, once you've had a chance to complete it. So just over a quarter of us voted. If you haven't Make sure we're clicking on an option and, and just uh, hit submit and we'll make sure we've got the answer through. There we go, so two thirds of us now and uh, coming up to the odd percent. So I might sh close that off and uh, share it back for our, uh, our last bit of discussion here. So um, 
feel no surprises in our, our last um, poll there around the threshold research, but uh, decision support tools also coming through quite strongly. Yep, yeah, that's a good one. Um, mm. Quick response. Okay, so um, everyone seems to be happy about uh, the way um, the system can respond. And I guess we've got a really good um, resource there with uh, the PESFAX team. Um, they're, they're always on the ball. Um, and I know it's been a real game changer uh, for uh, us in agronomists in general to have a, a mobile phone uh, with, a, with a camera that you can send off a, a, um, a photo and get a, a pretty quick response. Yeah, the dynamic uh, or economic thresholds, yeah, that's, that's no surprise. Uh, we do need more support there. Um, and the decision support tools, yeah, um, I think that's something for the future as well. Um, again, if we look back at what the cotton industry had, um, they've had uh, various um, decision support tools over the years to, um, uh, you, you know, um, going back to solar attack, uh, and um, that, that goes back 30 years probably. So. Um, those sort of models uh, are good and they could uh, be, be used um, to help our uh, the grain industry as well. And yeah, mentoring from experienced agronomists, yeah, it's important. Uh, the case study champions, I think we, we've probably got quite a range of um, uh, people we could draw on to uh, that, have, that have successfully introduced IPM. Um, yeah, we probably need to. Um, publicise those a bit more. And that's picking up on that point uh, earlier, Phil, around the opportunity those events have just afforded people to network with experienced agronomists and entomologists. Um, that, that was over two thirds of people saying that was um, really beneficial. Yep. Yep. Julia, I might pass to you, um, particularly comments on, on modelling. I know James Maynard at Caesar does quite a bit in this area uh, too. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can comment uh, too much on, on the modelling space. It, it's really um, uh, not, not my expertise area, but I would uh, mention just about in terms of the, the decision uh, support tools, um, CESA is currently working on a project um, looking at the effects of grains, um, pestic like pesticides that we use in grains and the rates that we use in grains on beneficials. And um, we should be able to have um, yeah, more industry uh, support tools and decision support tools for, uh, ready for industry um, in, in the near future. Because yeah, currently we do we are kind of looking to to the cotton guide, which which does use um, different um, insecticide rates. So while it's helpful um, to give an idea on pesticide effects on beneficials, it's not always relevant to the rates that we're using at grains in grains. Right. Thanks, Julia. There's been a couple of more questions uh, come through. What I might do is just uh, take those offline because we are coming up uh, to time at the moment. So Phil, I'll hand over to you now uh, just to wrap up the session and talk about uh, next steps and where to from here. Uh, yeah, look, um, thanks, thanks, Carl. Um, and yeah, look, thank you to everyone uh, for participating. Uh, it's been an interesting exercise uh, for us to set it up. Um, Carl and I talked about this before Christmas, so I'm, we must have known something like um, the um, um, self-isolating um, was going to, to uh, um, come um, at this time. So uh, it was quite timely uh, that we've had, had this webinar. Um, as far as uh, what's next? I guess um, uh, we've we've still got this is the, um, pretty much the end of that particular um, project uh, throughout New South Wales, and uh, we've had some good support from from all of you um, to run that, uh, and uh, with GRDC uh, funding, it, it's been really valuable. I think so. Hopefully. Um, Canala might get a bit better run this year than it, than it has the last couple. Um, and we're obviously going to be dealing with um, quite a few pests, um, you know, 
we've already already seen them in the, in the paddock. Um, it'll be interesting to see what range we get um, coming up this year. Um, so, but look, we've got still got the support there from Julia and the team at Caesar, um, and I'm available. Um, uh, you've got my contact details uh, if you need any help uh, or advice um, about pest management. So thank you, uh, thank you, Carl, for um, facilitating it. Thank you, Julia, for your support, and no to everyone online. Um, yeah, uh, just stay safe, and um, we'll obviously be talking to each other uh, in this manner um, in the future. I'm pretty sure. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll uh, engage with you soon. Bye for now.